job's done here, so <laughs> I'll just move alongside. All right. How is everyone doing? Now formally I'm asking you. Well. Well. So here's the good news. I'm not going to speak about threat intelligence. We had, I think, enough talks uh, today about it, both uh, uh, Vitaly and, and Crane. I'm going to speak about identity, identity as the new perimeter. I'm going to t talk about some of the challenges uh, related to detecting uh, identity access and permissions within the network. But first, uh, raise of a hand, who is here within IT operations? Okay, few. Who is here um, pen testing, security guys? Okay. And anyone threat intelligence? Not that I'm going to talk about it, but just from curiosity. Okay. So, actually, uh, I myself originally from Israel. From uh, my, my career started uh, at the Israeli Intelligence Corps. So I have been in the in, in the intelligence uh, community for a long time. I moved here to the U.S. Uh, 2002. Moved to New York and worked for multiple vendors uh, as a security engineer and as a threat intelligence engineer. But then I um, made a move into inside threat and worked for companies in the user's behavior analytics. So anyone here is into machine learning? That's where I started. That's where my passion really to machine learning started when I, when I got into uh, machine learning. So, um, We'll start with a couple of stories, and um, then we'll talk about identity and access-based prevention and machine learning. So this guy, his name is Victor, and he, he was a Toronto police officer. And he got shot. He got shot when he was 25 years old, uh, 2015, uh, just when he came out of a restaurant. And so an investigation started around this, which led to that lady. That lady's name is Erin. And Erin worked in the Toronto Police Department. And why was this uh, murder case related to Erin? Well, it looked like Erin was searching within their police department database information about Victor just a couple of months before his death. But not only for Victor, there were other five searches that for each one of those people, the person that Erin was looking for was either murdered or there was an attempt to murder them. That's, you don't want your name to be searched by that woman. And it took 16 months until the dots were connected. And the question was, why? And you won't believe it, but when they found out who the killer is, and they're trying to connect it to Victor, the only connection was that Victor gave a traffic ticket to that guy. So the guy that murdered the police guy probably murdered him as a revenge for getting a traffic ticket. So the question is, Erin, you think is Erin a threat? Was she a threat to the Toronto Police Department? Who thinks she was? I guess she did. She was an internal threat. Well, another story. Um, anyone knows this guy? Yeah, who is this? He was poisoned with uranium. He was, poisoned with uranium. He was uh, a former uh, KGB guy, Russian guy. And why was he poisoned? Well, the guy started his career in the KGB. And then at some point he, in his career, he had a conflict with the KGB leadership, uh, which at the time was connected and still connected to Putin. And he started to write articles against their activities, specifically against their activities uh, by bombing houses and then blaming Georgia and eventually helping bring Putin, Putin 
into leadership. So the end of the story is that he met some people that made sure that he's not going to survive for a long time. And we all know this guy, right? So Vladimir Putin is a threat, isn't he? He has a whole group of cyber espionage behind him. And they're all relating to making sure Russia, and specifically he, stays in power. And he is in power over 20 years, by the way. Started in the KGB, uh, moved in all the, the steps until he was a president, started 2000, made a, a legislation that will make sure that he can be a president for more than five years and so on. So is he a threat? Well, to some people, obviously he is, right? So why am I telling you those stories? But the idea here is that threat, whether it's an external or internal, has some commonality. In both cases, there is some kind of intent. There's some kind of an identity that eventually leads to action, leveraging capabilities, whether it's malware or anything else, and leveraging vulnerabilities. And so the idea behind identity is the new perimeter is let's look for those identities, right? Putting is, a, is an easy identity that everyone is familiar with, but let's find those errands. Let's find those inside threat. So this is what I'm going to do today. I'm gonna to talk to you about the identity-related attack vectors. And the identity-related attack vectors are mostly around passwords, around privilege escalations, and around lateral movements. So we will talk about those things and how hackers are using them. And then we'll look at some solutions uh, that are in the market today. Spoiler alert, there's no silver bullet that can fix all of those, right? Uh, it's gonna take uh, more than what we have today to fix the problem, but let's look at what we have out there. And then we'll try to kind of wrap up and, and, and uh, I'll be happy to have any Q&A. And by the way, you guys are welcome to ask any questions at any time. Right? I like to make it interactive. Sounds like a plan? Great. So disclaimer, <laughs> I'm, I'm just an Israeli with a Russian accent. Um, well, I speak Russian. And uh, that's why I like it interactively, right? If you don't agree with what I say, no harms. Um, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to kind of trying to solve this problem. So uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter and feel free uh, to voice your opinion. But I think on this one, we're all going to agree. Passwords are problems. <laughs> and passwords are easy to crack, even when they're not as simple as those ones. But people keep on using simple passwords because they need to remember them. And people keep on using passwords that remind them their date of birth or their college or their pet name, what have you. And how many of you guys using the same password in more than one application? There you go. And we are in a security conference. Now think about the, 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 the typical users. And I'm guilty as well. Um, because it's, cra it's crazy, right? And how many of you really changing your password? How many of you have a password that haven't been changed for the past year? Well, thank you for being honest. We have everyone almost between those two questions. So let me show you something that um, I found kind of uh, funny, but explains the, the, the problem better than I am.
cannot believe an Israeli will do that. <laughs> So, so yeah, it could be as simple as that. But even if it's not as simple as that, there's, there's, there's multiple other ways to, to crack passwords. Um, generally speaking, uh, you can use algorithms to crack passwords. Uh, if you have hashes, you can start to try to recover passwords out of hashes. Um, and there's, there's, anyone heard about the rainbow tables that reverse hashes? So, this is one, one way to do that. Um, others are uh, vulnerabilities. So there, there are cases, uh, for example, Azure Active Directory agent can basically uh, replicate permissions of a local Active Directory. So that's a Microsoft vulnerability that allows replication of hashes. And from there, we use something like rainbow tables in order to uh, reverse the cryptographic hash into a password. So that's a problem. I think we all can agree on that. So people started to think of a different approach, right? Let's try to use a passwordless solution. So probably all familiar with the biometric, right? You have a, this iPhone with the face recognition or the fingerprint. It's kind of working. There's a couple of problems with it, right? The first problem is that if someone's getting a hold of the database, that's basically like he got a hold of the biometric uh, footprint. So it's still something that you need to protect. Uh, the other ideas are around the, uh, the keyboards, uh, basically timing of your um, stroking the keyboard. So the idea behind it is the machine learning algorithm will be able to identify by the way you click the, uh, the, the information, who are you? It's not even close to be a, a, an exact science, and it cannot be used today, but it's a nice idea. And anyone heard of, of Windows Hello? So Windows, so Microsoft realized that, yeah, password is a problem, and so they are trying to come up also with solutions that relates to authentication based on hardware and not passwords. So a couple of the two tools, Benjamin uh, Delphi, uh, Delphi's uh, Mimikatz, everyone's heard of that. that that's one of the, the most popular tools that can help you with cracking passwords. John the Reaper, that's a free tool, by the way. It started with Unix, but now it has over 16 platforms that you can use with it. And like I mentioned earlier, Rainbow Crack. So uh, that's uh, Philippe uh, Oshenslin, um, and um, it's really helping with the faster time memory kind of tra trade up technique that helps you uh, find out uh, the passwords. So the second attack uh, vector is around privilege escalation. So now we, we harvest the password either, as you can see in this example, you just ask people and sometimes they, they're giving it out. But even if you're using spur phishing and spur phishing is still number one attack vector, you're getting a password. Normally, it's not going to be in the uh, privilege level that really allows you to create enough damage or to steal enough information. So you need to go through that uh, layers of privileges. That makes sense? And Windows has their, you have the system kind of uh, uh, level or the current level, and you have the user space. Um, in, in Windows, we have more layers. Microsoft actually doing a, a better job there than the default Linux, which has only two main uh, layers. Uh, but the question is, how are we going to do that? How are we going to um, escalate privileges? So there's a list of ways to escalate privileges. Um, you can steal other credentials after you stole the, the user's credentials, and those credentials might have enough privileges. Um, you actually can recover credentials from hashes that associated with NTLM, for example. If, ever, if anyone's familiar with that uh, protocol. Um, and then you can 
uh, what I would call leverage application vulnerabilities, okay? So a lot of applications having executables that calling DLLs. And then what we can do is we can move from the user's uh, space privilege into that application space privilege by injecting a, another DLL. Now maybe in the path of the executable, there is already an expected DLL. Uh, so I can look up this specific DLL, either replace it or add mine in a place within the pass, you're familiar with, with the pass that the application is looking for, um, and then kind of play a min, man in the middle and, and do whatever I want with my DLL code. So, um, so that's, that's the tools. And this is another video that kind of illustrate uh, what uh, privilege escalation looks in a physical life. Can you guys hear that, by the way? Or is that really real? I think, let me just get off. Uh, make sure my, yeah, I'm on full, so. I don't know if there's something we can do in that, but. That's okay. Well, well, basically. What's the video volume? Yeah, the the video volume is. Yeah, okay. Oh. Thank you. It's a little bit better, but I'll I'll give you a little bit background. Okay, that's that's basically a person that is trying to impersonate a marshal, police guy. So the guy is coming in, having a weapon. Okay, that's not funny anymore, right? Bad, bad. So, uh, I had a funny video, but that's not really addressing that, so. Not everything is gonna be funny. So, uh, privilege escalation also have a few tools. I think one of the, the main tools uh, for Linux is Broot, and the idea there, um, Actually, Broot is, is now also supporting Windows, but basically the idea is to help you escalate uh, those um, users into either a kernel system mode or a, uh, a Windows uh, administrator, local administrator. Um, anyone heard of PowerUp? PowerUp is a partial tool that identifies abused uh, vulnerabilities services. So the example I gave you earlier with the DLL, PowerUp can automatically kind of search for those executables uh, that looking for DLLs and help you uh, with identifying them. Uh, there's a, a Python implementation for Mimikatz, whoever likes Python. So uh, this is the, the, the PyCatz, pi 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 I guess, that's how uh, you pronounce it. And, and once you, you, you start to get a hold of those tools, um, you basically uh, can use one of them. So just as an example of what I mentioned earlier, uh, using the path variable for Windows, then you search for the DLLs, um, PowerUp is one of them, uh, PowerShell Empire is another one, Meta, Metasploit support that, um, and then you inject the DLL, uh, take the privileges, and start to communicating and moving it laterally. And this is exactly the next attack vector that I want to address. Lateral movement. Anyone is familiar with the kill chain? So the kill chain is all about external threats, right? It's usually when we identify those uh, 
adversaries group like the one we just um, mentioned from you know apt 28 from from russia they're doing a reconnaissance they are uh, uh, infiltrating by weaponizing some kind of a um, malware into their emails or they're sp uh, spoofing a domain and at that point they're inside the network they need to do lateral movement because that's not their goal that's not where the the crown jewels are in 90 percent of the, the time it's not 100 and so what i'm trying to do show here is that regardless whether it's an external threat or internal threat we have this idea of step by step that an internal identity needs to go by we spoke about stealing the password now that we administrator the next step will be lateral movement and lateral movement is kind of repeating uh, activity because what you do with lateral movement is you're trying to find the next host that you have access to, but that's not necessarily the final destination. So you're finding a host, right? And then from that host, you're trying to see if you can curve out a little bit more uh, privileges or services, and then you see if it, that gets you any closer to your target. But again, this is a process that keeps on repeating itself. You find the host, you might need to privilege, uh, um, escalate privileges again and move to the other host until you get your destination. And so from uh, lateral movement, um, here are some of the, the techniques used for lateral movement. By the way, um, there's a good description of each one of them uh, at MITRE ATT&CK framework, if you're familiar with it. Um, just look it up, ATT&CK with, with ampersand instead of A. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. If you are a Windows environment, anyone here doesn't work in a Windows environment? Doesn't work. Okay, well, good for you. <laughs> but if you do, then uh, you, you, you deal with Kerberos and with golden tickets and with all this fun. And there's a lot of good stuff that you can do here. There's also, there's also uh, um, information that relates to uh, lateral movement, relates only to, uh, to Linux or to Mac, but I'm going to focus on Windows now. So... How Kerberos works, just as an example. Anyone's familiar with Kerberos? Great, that's gonna be a very short lesson then. <laughs> so, so yeah, so there's, there's basically two tickets that you're using and it's kind of like when you're going into a music park. You're getting one ticket, the TGT, the ticket granted ticket, which just allows you to get into the park, but doesn't allow you to go on any of the rides. And then the other one is going to be a ticket that has to do with the service that you want to access. So it's going to be a service ticket, and the service ticket is allowing you to access only specific service, okay? Like only the printer, or only the finance app, or only whatever. So that's exactly how Kerberos works. You start by identifying yourself. You don't use your password within the network. You're using basically a specific uh, hash that you encrypt with your password, but then when you get a ticket, you basically use it to authenticate yourself against Active Directory or against the KDC, the key distribution center within Active Directory. And at that point, anytime you want to access something that is Kerberos uh, supported, you go back into the service center within the Active Directory, which is basically sitting within a domain controller. You ask for that, depending on your uh, user rights, you can get there. There's a ticket that the, uh, the Kerberos gives both to the server that you're trying to access and to you, and that's how you authenticate. Make sense? So in order to do that mapping between the, uh, the Kerberos uh, um, tickets that you're trying to, to access, uh, or the services, rather, that you're trying to access, and those specific services, you need kind of a mapping schema. And it's called SPN. SPN is basically uh, the, the principal names of those services that uh, Active Directory can give you access to. So it's basically telling you what are those services. So later on, when you want to access the service, you can say, okay, I want to access uh, MySQL or... Uh, um, Microsoft uh, SQL solution, right? 
So if I'm getting this ticket, um, I need to ask Active Directory on SPN. I can use that also um, as a hacker. So if I'm getting a foothold within the network and now I want to figure out what's going on, I'm doing a reconnaissance, a reconnaissance internally, I can start looking for all the SPN services within the network, okay? So what I do is, um, and, and that's not necessarily going to be um, detected immediately because that's the, that's the way it works, right? That's how other users will ask to access services within the network. That makes sense? So the SPNs will query, um, uh, this query is not going to be detected unless you run scanning. So what you do with scanning is basically you're trying to solve the problem of accessing each and every endpoint within the environment and ping and start to do scanning on the ports and figure out which services they have. Instead of that, you can just do an SPN all to the domain controller and say, just send me back all those uh, services that are supported Kerberos within the network, okay? Now, this is something that normally shouldn't be done. And so the idea here is that if we'll try to look at identities that doing stuff like that, like scanning the entire Active Directory for all services or enumerating users, those kind of things, this is something that you can literally watch on the network. You can literally monitor. And the only question is, should we do it or not? Um, the other thing that is dangerous when it goes into the Windows um, system and identity authentication is that there is one big secret that only the, the domain controller knows, and that's called the uh, curb TGT passwords or account. Anyone's familiar with that? That's basically the account that the Kerberos uh, system is using in order to hash their tickets to prove that this is basically authorizing, authorizing coming in from the Active Directory. So that secret node is only known to the domain controller. Nobody else knows that secret. And that's basically the way uh, it, it allows you to define which services you're going to. So it takes a ticket, the ticket says, okay, I'm allowed to go to that printer, and then they sign this uh, with the curb, uh, curb TGT password. So that everything is, is fine and dandy. But what if someone get a hold uh, on to the um, domain controller, right? What if the user is basically somehow um, moving laterally, getting into the domain controller and using Mimikatz just to dump the hash? Which hash? The hash of the curb TGT account, the master hash the key to the kingdom. If you get this thing, at this point, you can create your own tickets. It's almost like you can print money, right? So at this point, I can create what they call the golden ticket. So I can say, okay, the ticket is not going to have any expiration time, and by the way, this ticket is going to be able to access any other uh, service in the network, and by the way, this ticket belongs to user X. I don't even have to use my own user. So I can blame someone else, and the ticket will work because I have the Kerberos account password. So this is how I, 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 you look at it, right? The general admission is that the first, the TGT, the first ticket that everyone needs to get in order to even uh, authenticate itself against the Active Directory. Now, every time as a user, I will need to get an admin ticket for specific user. But if I th go through uh, the attack pattern that I just mentioned, I'm getting the golden ticket. I can access anything on the network. Just one example of lateral movement. Um, again, you can look at uh, MITRE attack framework to learn others. This is a pretty, pretty powerful one. So what can we do about it? Well, Here's the problem. A lot of those things are done by people. And the, the main question is, what's their intent? And one of the things I mentioned earlier, you know, when I came from threat intelligence, I looked at it and said, yeah, that makes sense. But when it comes to you know, identity within the organization, I realized that sometimes people just make mistakes. Some 
time, people are just stupid. <laughs> and they're just doing stuff, not because they have bad intention. So that's why I was like, mm, this all threat thing is not always true, right? So how do we do that? How do we identify activity and kind of trying to figure out if that person just made a mistake or maybe that's really a malicious actor or maybe that's just a user that is trying to exfiltrate data because he's going to leave in a week and he's angry. Right? All of those might have the same exact behavior. How do we differentiate? Because people will make mistakes. And people, adversaries included, have needs. So we need to understand people almost like to start motivating or sorry, start understanding their motivation. We need to understand their behavior. Um, and uh, is anyone familiar with the, the Moscow's hierarchy of needs? Yes. Basically, there's, there's common commonalities around all of us, right? We all want this love, the affection. Sometimes we do things just to feel great about it. Sometimes we do things because uh, we want security. Sometimes we don't do the right thing because we're afraid. All of those things uh, should be kind of considered when we're looking at the user's activities. There are all kind of different use cases, but it's all come to the individuals. And the problem is people don't like to change. And well, it's, not, it's not necessarily a problem. It's actually kind of helping us because when we're using user behavior analytics, we are counting on that be people are boring. So each and every of us, I mean, when I say people are boring, I mean their behavior is boring. Sorry, not people are boring. But every time we go into work, right, we go um, and log in, and probably log in into the same machine. We have kind of a pattern of behavior. There are working hours. There are specific servers that we're responsible to, to work on. And so over time, we can kind of create a baseline. And that baseline uh, is not, and, you know, generally speaking, not going to really change around people. Um, so given all this stuff, right, people make mistakes, um, you know, People um, uh, don't like to change, and people have some needs. How can we start learning what a normal behavior is? And we do that on the network, right? Today, we're using network um, activities, monitoring devices that tells us what is the bandwidth on the network, uh, what's the memory usage, what's the CPU usage, right? We're looking at activities with regards to seasons, right? The seasons uh, of activities. Uh, we're looking at uh, east, west, north, west, what have you. Um, we're looking at the number of pages that uh, are being hit on a specific website. We have ways to look at that from a network perspective. Well, from a user's perspective, it's a little bit more complicated. But we can still start to move into identifying what's the right user behavior or what's a normal user behavior is. So how can we do that? Well. First of all, we're starting to monitor those logins information that I just mentioned earlier. Every time you log in into Active Directory, it's really easy for us to know that. Uh, every time you're looking into your uh, applications through the firewall, we, we know that. We have monitoring the firewalls. Every time you're accessing the network from a VPN, we can monitor that as well. That makes sense? Now we're starting to create a profile of users' activity. Um, and with time, uh, we know also, obviously, where you're working, which department you're working at, what your peer groups are doing, <laughs> so we can compare your activity to um, other activity within your team, or your activity to your activity a week ago. One thing that we, uh, we can use is basically a single sign-on. That's going to help us with what? Why single sign-on can help us with uh, identity behavior analytics? Anyone? Well, if you are signing in with the same username and password, I can eventually link that access to specific one username. And that username is going to be accountable for whatever is being done there. OK? So think about it this way. If I will have one account on a cloud and another account within the enterprise. 
and I access those in two different ways with two different passwords, how would anyone know that this is not two different people, right? You'll have to start making those links between the accounts. It's making it much more easier uh, if uh, you have one username and password and you're using single sign-on and you basically have a unified visibility of the activity of the individual. So there's a couple of pros and cons. Um, basically, the whole idea behind SSO is that it, it does help both from a user's perspective experience, right? You don't need to log in twice with a password again and again. And also, it reduces the attack surface because whenever you use your password, you expose it, and there's a, there's a way uh, or there's a risk that someone's going to get it. The cons is that it, um, if someone's getting a hold of your passwords, you probably lost access to much more or many more applications, right? So uh, you need to be careful about that. How are we doing the time-wise? We good with time? Yeah. Other option is MFA. Anyone familiar with those with the phones that you get uh, alerts whenever there is a we want to double check your authentication? That's a great solution. Why? Because this is a physical phone that you hold and prove that you are who you claim or you are. Okay, that's great. Also, if you're familiar with the key fob, right? Anyone uses or used key fob in the past? Same idea. One time password. All of those things are helping to identify or double identify you. There is a problem, however, with, with, that, uh, with those, uh, and the problem is that there's a lot of pushback from the organization on the usability, right? Imagine that you will go to a place where every time you're logging into your PC, you have to approve that this is you by um, punching a, a, you know, getting an SMS and punching a, a code. If you have an option, you're probably not going to stay at that workplace for a long time. <laughs> so this, this has to be some kind of a balance between the, um, the security requirements, but also from a you know, user experience perspective. Um, the pluses, of course, is that definitely whenever you approve or verify or answer a challenge, that you basically just prevented another event going into the SIM, another alert that will end up using uh, being a, a false positive because it is you. Uh, so so that, that's definitely helping the security uh, organization. So what do we do? We're starting with the baseline. This is where the machine learning is getting into space. We don't know exactly what everyone's going to do and whatever they're going to use. So we need to look at a lot of parameters we need to harvest all those indicators and we need to do a machine learning baseline. Baseline telling us, okay, this is from what we see is normal. And then from here, we're going to deviate. Every time it deviates, we give a small increment of risk score to the guy or the girl, right? And every time they're coming back to normal, we reduce it. So it's a dynamic thing and it's not binary, it's not zero or one. It's always a risk score, it could be between zero and 100 that tells us, okay, how risky this user? John is 80, Sarah is 40. Probably I want to watch John a little bit closer than Sarah. That makes sense? So continuously doing that. And the risk score is not only b based on the user's behavior analytics, but also on the likelihood of this happening and the impact. In other words, if John is an administrator user, he should get a much higher risk score than Sarah if Sarah is, is a user with basically no privileges, right? So depending on who you are, are you executive or are you a DevOps or are you HR or your finance, you might get a higher risk score just by the nature of your privileges. So this is a table that I created that kind of show an example of what to look at when you create a risk score. So assets, right? Do you have access to the crown jewels, to, to the uh, credit card servers? Do you have uh, services that are critical under your belt? Do you have um, executives that you are having access to? Um, which applications you're logging into? And then these the baseline activities like how often do you log to that? Uh, where do you log from uh, geographically, et cetera, et cetera? And this is eventually how it's gonna look like. 
right? You're gonna have Rita Parker is having this history activity. Her risk score has changed. Every time it changed up or down, we explain uh, to ourselves, right, why it happened. And by the way, each and every one of you guys have a risk score. You know why? Because you're using online banking and using activities that people as a, a consumer are monitoring. So 90% of the banks today monitoring the users and giving them some kind of a risk score. Each one of you guys have a risk score. Now, this whole machine learning thing is not a, and, you know, a hundred percent kind of guarantee or, uh, um, and the problem behind it is that uh, it really depends on, on those things that we, we mentioned earlier, right? Mistakes uh, improve over time. Uh, and so the idea is to look at it, but not necessarily uh, to use it all the time as, as a uh, prevention kind of uh, activity. It's just a risk score. And the risk score itself is going to improve with time. Um, but, but it does give you an idea of where to look at from, from a user's perspective. Well, actually, this video is funny. All right, so this is one way to verify your, your authentication. So getting close to the summarize, what we looked at is we want to create a risk score that is based on your uh, specific activities and specific impact, right? We can create a list of all kinds of impacts based on activities. Then we can create a list of responses that's relevant to those activities, right? And you can basically, depending on your organization, you want to start being proactive. Depending on the risk, depending on the impact, you might just want to reset the password of a user, you want to enforce the user uh, to an MFA, challenge them on MFA. You might want to basically go ahead and ask the user to reset, uh, not, not to reset, but uh, demote their privileges. And you can keep on watching those things over time and see whether the user is really using those things, right? And then you can create policies. And the policies can be either written policies or actual automations with your organizations that will look at the behavior and automatically take action. Real-time response, okay, adaptive challenge, for example. Not MFA whenever you log in into your machine, but MFA whenever you log in first time to a server that you haven't logged into for the past six months. That makes sense? And also service accounts. Everyone is scared of service accounts. Oh, I'm not going to touch it, right? Like, this can break something. Well, did it work in the past week? Did it work in the past year? Does it have a weak password? What is the service account all about? I mean, we're too scared to break things, and we're not looking at what they're doing. Is it really a service account? Or is there an administrator that's leveraging those accounts and using it manually? This is something that machine learning can easily found because service accounts have specific times, uh, specific way they run. If it runs interactively, if it has an interactive login, 
That's probably a human being. That's not the script. That's not programmatic, right? So look at those things. And then start to be reactive, right? Look at uh, the orchestration tools in your systems and see if they can leverage those alerts on user behavior analytics. Uh, look at blocking users that really doing stupid stuff, right? Really stupid stuff. Adaptive response. Be more responsive to things. Now, Microsoft is doing some good stuff around it. Have to give them a credit, right? They're starting to work around understanding those Kerberos tickets, weaknesses that I showed you earlier, the NTLM. And so what they're doing is they're starting to create what they call a, a credential guards. They have a very uh, specific memory space where they keep the information so you cannot just dump it. You cannot just uh, inject yourself into the ELSA uh, um, DLL and see text, uh, free text uh, of passwords. Uh, but we still need to address the human's activities around passwords, okay? We need to enforce strong enough passwords. We need to educate people to use this pass password responsibly because this is the low-hanging fruit. We need to help with understanding, with privileged perspective, that users that shouldn't have access to an admin shouldn't be admin. Local administrators, in most cases, is not required for regular users. And based on their activities, see if they're leveraging the users, the, the, the privilege they have. If they don't, reduce it. And lateral movement. Be aware of those specific cases, specific use cases uh, from MITRE attack, and the specific one I mentioned here today, and try to monitor them. Look at them over time and create kind of a heat map where you see which one of those tactics and techniques is used more in your network. And then within time, you're going to identify where are your weakest links, all right? And then address those things. And eventually, don't forget that the kill chain is not only external threat, it's also internal threat. You need to look at those things as well. Block the kill chain earlier in the stages, in the beginning, before it really reach the execution, by using those step-up authentications, the MFA challenge, the reset of password, those stuff that uh, helps you to identify whether this is a real user or this is a user that basically stole someone else's user. So to summarize, there's a lot of similarities between internal and external threats. Uh, identity behavior can help us. Identity is the new perimeter. We just need to leverage the tools. There's no silver bullet, right? But start thinking about those specific tools that are already out there in order to identify lateral movement, to identify password harvesting, and to identify privilege escalation. And eventually, try to uh, start with controls that make this balance between users' uh, experience and security needs. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions.